Section 13 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roxanne Weber, R-O-X-A-N-N-E-W-E-B-E-R.com. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930, by Various. Story, The Gray Plague, Chapter 2. The steam yacht, Diana, bound for the Azores and points south, was two days out from Miami when the great meteor fell into the Atlantic. On the afterdeck, leaning over the rail, watching the moonlit waters, stood Philip Parkinson, owner of the yacht. A bacteriologist of international fame was Parkinson, on an early vacation to recuperate from the effects of a strenuous winter of research. Nervous, rather high-strung, he had been unable to sleep. At about one in the morning of the 18th of March, he had come up on deck. He had stood there for about an hour, when suddenly there appeared in the sky above him a meteor, a great disk of blue-white incandescence. It seemed to be rushing straight down towards him. Instinctively, he leaped back, as though to avoid the fiery missile. As the constantly expanding disk flashed through the hundred miles of Earth's atmosphere, the ocean, as far as I could see, became as light as day. Bathed in that baleful white glare, Parkinson, bewildered, dazed, half-blinded, watched the approaching stellar visitant. In a few moments it struck, no more than two miles away. In the last bright flare of blue-white light, Parkinson saw a gigantic column of steam and boiling water leap up from the sea. Then thick, impenetrable darkness fell, darkness that was intensified by its contrast with the meteor's blinding light. For ten tense, breathless seconds, utter silence hung over the sea. Then, for those on the yacht, the world went mad. A shrill, unearthly shriek, the sound of the meteor's passage through the atmosphere, an ear-splitting roar, as of the simultaneous release of the thunder drums of ages, a howling demon of wind, a solid wall of raging, swirling water of immeasurable height all united in an indescribable chaos that bewildered those on board the Diana and that lifted the yacht and threw it upon its side. When the first rushing mountain of lathering, thundering water crashed upon the yacht, Parkinson felt himself hurled through the roaring air. For a moment he heard the infernal pandemonium of noise. Then the strangling, irresistible brine closed over his head a blackness deeper than that of the night, and Parkinson knew no more. Slowly, consciousness returned to the bacteriologist. It came under the guise of a dull, yet penetrating throbbing coming from beneath the surface on which he lay. Vaguely, he wondered at it. He had not yet entirely cast off the enshrouding stupor that gripped him. Gradually, he came into full possession of his faculties and became aware of a dull aching throughout his entire body. In his chest, it seemed to be intensified. Every breath caused a sharp pang of pain. Faltering and uncertain, he arose and peered around. Before lay the open sea, calm now and peaceful. Long, rolling swells swept in and dashed themselves against the rocks a few feet away. Rocks? For a moment, Parkinson stared at the irregular shoreline in dazed wonder. Then as his mind cleared, the strangeness of his position flashed upon him. Solid earth was under his feet. Although he must be hundreds of miles from shore, in some way he had drifted upon land. So far as he knew, there were no islands in that part of the Atlantic. Yet his very position belied the truth. He could not have drifted to the mainland. The fact that he was alive precluded all possibilities of that, for he would have drowned in far less time than the latter thought implied. He turned and inspected the land upon which he had been cast, a small, barren island, bleak and inhospitable, and strangely metallic, met his gaze. The rays of the sun beating down upon it were thrown back with an uncomfortable intensity. The substance of the island was a lustrous copper-like metal. No soil softened the harshness of the surface. Indescribably rugged and pitted was the 200-foot expanse. It reminded Parkinson of a bronze relief map of the moon. 
For a moment, he puzzled over the strangeness of the unnatural island. Then suddenly, he realized the truth. This was the meteor. Obviously, this was the upper side of the great sphere from space protruding above the sea. Fortunate for him that the meteor had not been completely covered by water, he thought. But was it fortunate? True, he was alive now, thanks to the tiny island. But how long would he remain alive without food or water and without hope of securing either? Unless he would be picked up by a passing steamer, he would die a far more unpleasant death than that of drowning. Some miracle had saved him from a watery grave. It would require another to rescue him from a worse fate. Even now he was beginning to feel thirsty. He had no way of determining how long he had been unconscious, but that it was at least ten hours he was certain, for the sun had been at its zenith when he had awakened. No less than fifteen hours had gone by since water, other than that of the sea, had passed his lips and the fact that it was impossible for him to quell his thirst only served to render it more acute. In order to take his mind from thoughts of his thirst and of the immediate future, he rapidly circled the island. As he had expected, it was utterly barren. With shoulders drooping in despair, he settled wearily to a seat on the jagged mass of metal high up on top of the meteor. An expression of sudden interest lit up his face. For a second time, he felt that particular throbbing, that strange pulsing beneath the surface of the meteor. But now it was far more noticeable than before. It seemed to be directly below him and very close to the surface. Parkinson could not tell how long he sat there, but from the appearance of the sun, he thought that at the very shortest, an hour passed by while he remained on that spot. And during that time, the throbbing gradually increased until the metal began vibrating under his feet. Suddenly, the bacteriologist leaped aside. The vibrating had reached its height, and the meteor seemed to lurch, to tilt at a sharp angle. His leap carried him to firm footing again, and then, his thirst and hopeless position completely forgotten, Parkinson stared in fascination at the amazing spectacle before him. An 18-foot disc of metal, a perfect circle, seemed to have been cut out of the top of the meteor. While he watched, it began turning slowly, ponderously, and started sinking into the meteor. As it sank, Parkinson fancied that it grew transparent and gradually vanished into nothingness, but he wasn't sure. A great pit, 18 feet wide but far deeper, lay before him in the very place where, not more than 10 minutes before, he had stood. Not a moment too soon had he leaped. Motionless he stood there, waiting in tense expectation. What would happen next? He had not the least idea, but he couldn't prevent his imagination from running riot. He hadn't long to wait before his watching was rewarded. A few minutes after the pit appeared, he heard a loud, high-pitched whirr coming from the heart of the meteor. As it grew louder, it assumed a higher and still higher key, finally rising above the range of human ears. And at that moment, the strange vehicle arose to the surface. A simple appearing mechanism was the car, consisting of a 12-foot sphere of the same bronze-like metal that made up the meteor, with a huge wheel, like a bronze cincture, around its middle. It was the whirling of this great wheel that had caused the high-pitched whirling. The entire strange machine was surrounded by a peculiar green radiance, a radiance that seemed to crackle ominously as the sphere hovered above the mouth of the pit. For a moment, the car hung motionless. Then it drifted slowly to the surface of the meteor, landing a few feet away from Parkinson. Hastily, he drew back from the greenly phosphorescent thing, but not before he had experienced an unpleasant, prickling sensation over his entire body. As the bacteriologist drew away, there was a sharp, audible click within the interior of the sphere, and the green radiance vanished. At points in the sides of the car and held the sphere in a balanced position on the rounded top of the meteor. At the same moment, three heavy metal supports sprang from equidistant points in the sides of the car and held the sphere in a balanced position on the rounded top of the meteor. There was a soft, grating sound on the opposite side of the car. Quickly, Parkinson circled it and stopped short in surprise. Men were descending from an opening in the side of the sphere. 
Parkinson had reasoned that since the meteor had come from the depths of space, any being in its interior, unnatural as that seemed, would have assumed a form quite different from the human. Of course, conditions on Earth could be approximated on another planet. At any rate, whatever the explanation, the sphere was emitting men. They were men, but there was something queer about them. They were very tall, seven feet or more, and very thin, and their skins were a delicate, transparent white. They looked rather ghostly in their tight-fitting white suits. It was not this that made them seem queer, however. It was an indefinite something, a vague suggestion of heartless inhumanity, of unearthliness, that was somehow repulsive and loathsome. There were three of them, all very similar in appearance and bearing. Their surprise at the sight of Parkinson, if anything, was greater than the start their appearance had given him. He, at least, had expected to see beings of some sort, while the three had been taken completely by surprise. For a moment, they surveyed him with staring, cold blue eyes. Then Parkinson extended his hand, and as cordially as he could, exclaimed, Hello! Welcome to Earth! The visitors from space ignored his advances and continued staring at him. Their attitude at first was quizzical, speculative, but slowly a hostile expression crept into their eyes. Suddenly, with what seemed like common consent, they faced each other and conversed in low tones in some unintelligible tongue. For almost a minute they talked, while Parkinson watched them in growing apprehension. Finally, they seemed to have reached some definite conclusion. With one accord, they turned and moved slowly towards the bacteriologist. Something distinctly menacing in their attitudes. The men from the meteor were tall, but they were thin. Parkinson, too, was large, and his six-foot length was covered with layers of solid muscle. As the three advanced toward him, he doubled his fists and crouched in readiness for the expected attack. They were almost upon him when he leaped into action. A crushing left to his stomach sent the first one to the meteor top, where he lay doubled up in pain. But that was the only blow that Parkinson struck. In a moment, he found himself lying prone upon his back, utterly helpless, his body completely paralyzed. What they had done to him, he did not know. All that he could remember was two thin bodies twining themselves around him, a sharp twinge of pain at the base of his skull. Then absolute helplessness. One of the tall beings grasped Parkinson about the waist and with surprising strength threw him over his shoulder. The other assisted his groaning fellow. When the ladder had recovered to some extent, the three ascended the ladder that led into the metal sphere. The interior of the strange vehicle, as far as Parkinson could see, was as simple as its exterior. There was no intricate machinery of any sort in the square room. Probably what machinery there was lay beneath the interior and exterior walls of the sphere. As for controls, these consisted of several hundred little buttons that studded one of the walls. When they entered the vehicle, Parkinson was literally, and none too gently, dumped upon the floor. The man who had carried him in stepped over to the controls. Like those of a skilled typist, his long, thin fingers darted over the buttons. In a moment, the sphere was in motion. There were no more thrills for Parkinson in that ride than he would have derived from a similar ride in an elevator. They sank very slowly for some minutes, it seemed to him. Then they stopped with a barely noticeable jar. The door of the car was thrust aside by one of the three, and Parkinson was borne from the sphere. A bright, coppery light flooded the interior of the meteor, seeming to radiate from its walls. In his helpless state and in the awkward position in which he was carried, with his head close to the floor, he could see little of the room through which they passed, in spite of the light. Later, however, he learned that it was circular in shape and about twice the diameter of the cylindrical tube that led into it. The wall that bound this chamber was broken at regular intervals by tall, narrow doorways, each leading into a different room. Parkinson was carried into one of these and was placed in a high-backed metal chair. After he had been strapped fast, one of the men placed his hands at the base of the bacteriologist's skull. He felt a sudden twinge of pain, and his strange paralysis left him suddenly. He knew it was useless to struggle. Without resisting, he let them place upon his head a cap-like device that seemed lost in a tangled maze of machinery. Each meteor man grasped one of the instruments, resembling old-time radio headphones, that were fastened to Parkinson's headgear and clamped it over his ears. 
The bacteriologist heard a steady, humming drone, like a swarm of angry bees, felt a peculiar, soothing warmth about his head, and then he slept. Only a moment or two seemed to have passed when he awoke. The strange device on his head was removed and put away, and then, to Parkinson's amazement, one of the three men, evidently the leader, spoke in English. Now that you have recovered consciousness, he remarked in a cold, expressionless voice, you had better realize at the very beginning that you are completely in our power. Any effort to escape will be futile, for there is only one way to reach the outside, the opening through the top, and only one means of travel through that opening, the sphere. And since you knew nothing about the operation of the machine, any attempt to run it would be disastrous to you. If you promise to refrain from violence, we'll release you and give you some measure of freedom. We'll do this because you can be of assistance to us in one of our tasks here on your planet, Parkinson assented readily. He knew he could gain nothing by rejecting their offer. Of course, I'll promise. But, but how did you learn English? He asked in bewilderment. You taught us, the leader replied. That device we placed upon your head created a duplicate of your knowledge in our minds. We knew your language, your world, indeed yourself as well as you do. Parkinson shook his head in amazement. Another question came to his mind as the men released him. He was interrupted before he could give it expression. Don't ask, the leader exclaimed. I'll tell our entire story so that you'll have no occasion to annoy us with your questions. We're Venerians, he began, inhabitants of the planet you call Venus. For ages, our world has been overcrowded. A short time ago, the conditions became so acute that something had to be done. It was suggested that we seek another habitable planet to which our people could migrate. Your Earth was thought to be the world with physical conditions most closely resembling those of a core, or Venus. Our scientists set to work immediately, using forces and devices with which you are totally unfamiliar, and constructed several missiles which they hurled at Earth. These missiles, spherical masses closely resembling meteors, were set to explode after a certain period of contact with an atmosphere similar to our own. By their explosion, we on Venus could determine whether or not this world had a breathable atmosphere. Upon our deciding that the Earth was habitable, we built this great machine. It is chiefly composed of our greatest heat resistor, a metal we call folk. I see no corresponding word in your vocabulary. Evidently, you are unfamiliar with the element, or else it is unknown on Earth. After our flight through space, automatically controlled, by the way, on Venus, we landed here. With our throat disintegrator, we bored a passageway to the surface of this great sphere. Then we entered the car rose to the top of the passageway and discovered you. That is a brief synopsis of our actions, and it must suffice. Ask no more questions. We do not wish to be disturbed by the blind gropings of your primitive mind. There was a cold finality in the Venerian's voice that convinced Parkinson that for the moment, at least, he had better forget the many questions that had surged up in his mind. The Venerian leader spoke again. From our observations of your mind, we know that you have not had food or water for a rather lengthy period of time. It is not our purpose to starve you. You shall eat and drink. A minute later, Parkinson sat at a very high table in one of the rooms, drinking water from Venus and eating the fare of an alien world. Days passed by, merging into weeks, while Parkinson lost all track of time. The bacteriologist's existence became a ceaseless round of toil. The Venerian had said that he would be given some measure of freedom because he would be of use to them. He had not been with them long ere he learned what that use was. One of the rooms was filled with great slabs of thoke. It was Parkinson's task to carry the slabs to the vehicle at the base of the shaft, one by one, to rise to the surface with them, accompanied by two of the men. The third was working on the surface, and there unload them. Day after day this continued. Hope of escaping was almost dead in Parkinson's breast because he was constantly under the surveillance of those hard, blue eyes. Only one thing kept hope alive. By watching the Venerians operate the car, he was slowly gaining a knowledge of the meaning of the many buttons in the wall. Some day, if an opportunity came, he meant to be ready to take advantage of it. Once, shortly before his monotonous toil began, Parkinson experienced a great flare of hope for deliverance. 
They had just brought another slab to the surface when a steamer appeared above the horizon. It was far away, but its crew must surely have seen the island. But his expectations were short-lived. One of the three drew from beneath his tight-fitting white garments a little metal object, a long tube with a handle at one end, and pointed it at the vessel. For a moment, he held it thus, moving it slowly backward and forward. Then he returned it to its place of concealment and turned away with an air of indifference. And Parkinson saw the ship burst suddenly into flame, a few minutes later to sink beneath the waves. Shaken to the depths of his being, Parkinson resumed his work. The inhumanity of these Saturnine Venerians filled him with a dread so great that he refused to admit it to himself. That that had not been the first time that they had destroyed a ship, he felt sure. His heart sank and grew more hopeless. At last, his task of carrying slabs was finished. The room was empty and the work completed. A great tower entirely covering the island reared its head into the sky. In appearance, it resembled a very tall lighthouse. This resemblance held true only until its top was reached. There it ended. From the tower's top extended four long, hollow arms, so constructed that they whirled about the tower at a mad pace when the machinery with which they were connected was started. In addition, arrangement was made for a powerful blast of air to be sent through the tubes when the Venerians so desired. What the purpose of this great edifice was, Parkinson could not guess. Later, he learned the horrible significance of it all. After the tower was finished, the bacteriologist was left to his own devices to a great extent, though always closely watched by one of his captors. They let him eat all the food he desired and let him lie around as much as he wished, regaining his health and strength. This was a pleasant surprise for him. He took full advantage of his privileges. Then, one day when Parkinson had fully recovered from the effects of his grueling labors, the leader of the Venerians approached him from behind, and before he could raise a hand in defense, had rendered him helplessly paralyzed. You will now be given a second opportunity to help the cause of Venus on Earth, he said in his expressionless voice. And so saying, he lifted Parkinson and bore him into one of the rooms. End of story, The Gray Plague, Chapter 2. Recording by Roxanne Weber, R-O-X-A-N-N-E-W-E-B-E-R dot com.